For today's grim adventure, we find ourselves once again in Hollywood, California, this time returning to Icons of Darkness, one of our favorite places to be in Hollywood. And we have a special guest. It's not Wednesday. Instead, it's the, the owner, the man behind Icons of Darkness, a man by the name of Rich Carell. Now just a heads up, it is a rainy day here in Hollywood, California, which makes it a perfect opportunity to head back inside Icons of Darkness. Now today's a little special because right down this way, Carrie Fisher from Star Wars Princess Leia is getting her walk on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and they got this entire street closed down. Right now I'm, I'm leaning on a fence right here. And I'm guessing they have it closed down because, well, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, it'd be kind of cool if we saw them, but there is no way we're getting anywhere close to that. So we're going inside to look at monsters. To give you an idea how much we love these guys, as seen on all these amazing places, and then right down here in the bottom left-hand corner, you see it? The Grim Life Collective. Hey everybody, my name is Rich Carell and here we are at Icons of Darkness. Icons of Darkness is a museum of a lot of stuff that I've collected over the last 60 years that relates to science fiction, fantasy, and horror films. So let me tell you how I kind of got started. When I was a kid, I was an actor. This is me when I'm 11 years old in Leave it to Beaver. I was one of Beaver's best friends in the series for about three and a half seasons. The name was Richard Rickover. While I was doing the Leave it to Beaver show, and we were at Universal, so we were really excited because that's where all the horror stuff was, Jerry Mathers and I asked our makeup guy to take us up to the lab so we could see a lot of this stuff. And we loved going there, but we were always amazed at the stuff they were throwing in the trash. You guys, they threw so much great stuff in the trash. They threw the creature from the Black Lagoon land suit in the trash, which at auction today is worth about a million seven. And I'm not exaggerating, but that ended up in the trash. Well, there was a head in the trash from this movie down here called Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The head specifically was here, and here's a picture of Boris Karloff and Bud Westmore, and here's Karloff wearing it. They threw that in the trash, and I was able to find that. I knew what it was, so I saw it in the trash, and I said, hey, can I take that? And the guys went, yeah, sure, go ahead and take it. So that kind of started this collecting thing, and that was back in 1960. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about my career. Um, I've spent my entire life starting with things like Beaver in comedy. So I was doing comedy television shows. I worked for Gary Marshall, producing Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days. Uh, after I did that, I went to the Miller Boyette Company, working for ABC, where I became producer and then the series director on Hogan Family, Step by Step, Family Matters, Perfect Strangers, Full House. So I've directed a lot of comedy. And then I went to Disney when they started ramping up multi-camera shows. And I was series director on That's So Raven, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Then I created Hannah Montana, co-created it. Uh, I was series director on that too. And then in the year uh, 2018, I celebrated my 700th episode. I've now directed 719 episodes. I'm retiring out of that business. And the thing that's cool is, all of this stuff, as I mentioned, was comedy, comedy, comedy. Everything was comedy. But my hobby from the time I was a kid and then throughout my entire career, was collecting science fiction, fantasy, and horror film memorabilia. So it was just the polarity of the comedy stuff. And so you're gonna see some of the stuff I've collected. Here at Icons in Hollywood is about 48% to 50% of the collection, but it's still a lot of stuff. And there's some stuff in here that's really cool that I want you guys to see. So come on, we're gonna, we're gonna go this way and step into the collection. Now, we were here in the past, probably yeah. about a year ago, yeah. and it completely blew our minds, both Jessica and <laughs> good, good. And sadly, you weren't there with us. And I, I've been wanting to ask you this question for quite some time. Out of all of the amazing pieces here, is there five things, three, five things, maybe 10, 15, 20 things that you cannot believe are in this room? Well, the thing is you get used to a collection like this and you, it, it's hard, they're like your kids. It's hard to 
choose which ones you like the best. But I think based on what the public sees, there's some stuff here that's really cool. Like for instance, I'm really excited that we have Michael Keaton's bat suit from the first movie and it's the first one he wore in the first movie. You know he's coming back now as Batman after all those years, but we have his original suit. We have a number of his suits, but the first one is really, really cool. That's right over here, if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this is the first suit that Michael Keaton wore in the Tim Burton Batman film in 1989. We're really happy to have this here. It's got a lot of nice detail. It happens to be in really good shape. There were a number of capes they made, including some of the ones that would flare up. This is the first one, as I said. It's the real belt. The thing is, you guys, the shoes, it's really funny because he's wearing Nike tennis shoes. I don't know if they had tested him and put him in boots and he said, oh, I'm not comfortable, but he always had, he had Nikes in this and Jordans in the second movie and this is his costume from the second movie. But I always thought that was pretty funny because the actor wanted to be comfortable. But anyway, this is su super cool because as far as the series of Batman film that started with Burton's film in 89, that's the first suit from the first movie. So I'm like really proud to have that here. On this Bat costume, it's a lot of cool things, but there's also something about this cape, and, and our guy Pat Evans here is gonna tell you about that. So it's made of elephant hide vinyl, and it's coated with latex on the outside there to see to give it that bat wing texture. And then on the inside, it's double layered. It's got a layer of Venetian wool in there. So this cape's uh, about 30 pounds. Plus it has rods on the inside here to be able to pull it up and spread it out like a bat wing. Now, whenever people come here, do not touch anything. This is just something special. Precisely. <laughs> okay. And uh, one more special thing for you guys, because you are VIPs. We're going to show you how far his boots go up. Oh, wow. Speaking of bat suits, because we have Robin suits, we have bat suits, we have bat girl suits. But this is Val Kilmer's sonar suit from Batman Forever. And what's really interesting about this is it's a bit of a hybrid because when Clooney came in wearing the ice suit, and that's right behind you over there, it's the same suit with just some modifications and silver pieces added. So it's one of the only suits that made it across both movies, or at least one of the only designs. This was made for Kilmer, that was made for Clooney, but that design was reused. So that's really cool about that. And I love having this here. That's my favorite bat suit. You know, Christopher Reeve uh, Superman suits are pretty rare. This one is really cool because it made it across two movies because this was his suit that they used for flying. Dick Donner directed both Superman 1 and 2, and so they shot all the flying stuff at one time for both movies, and that's one of the suits he was in doing the flying stuff. Everybody loved Christopher Reeve. Definitively, he's still one of the best Superman ever. Of course, we all know what happened to him, which was tragic, but he really was awesome, and I loved him, so I wanted him here in the show. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you something that's really cool. First of all, I loved Heath Ledger's the Joker. That's my favorite Joker. I think that's most people's favorite Joker, even though Nicholson was great and Joaquin Phoenix was great. Um, but I got part of his costume. I say part of it because the vest, the tie, the shirt, even the shoes and socks are all his originals from the movie. And the thing that's really weird is when I purchased this stuff, when I was able to get my hands on it, I got it on a Wednesday afternoon and he died on the next Friday morning, a day and a half later. It was so weird, but to have his stuff. And you know, I, I miss him. I think he was a great actor. He has to be in here, not just because he was the best Joker, in my opinion, but because Heath Ledger was such an awesome actor. So we want to make sure we pay tribute to him here, not just for this part, but just his career. The guy was awesome. And I'm, I'm really happy he's here. Okay, now strangely enough, my favorite figure in this entire collection is Margaret Hamilton, who is the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz from 1939. Now, why is that my favorite figure? Because it's a replica. It's a replica built by Mike Hill. Mike Hill is unbelievable. He's one of the best artists in the business. He's doing most of Guillermo del Toro stuff now. But Mike loves, loves, loves the old movie. So the universal stuff and the old stuff, if he sculpts it and builds it, it's fantastic. But aside from that, Judy Garland was my next door neighbor for years and years when she was married to a guy named Sid Luft. And she had a stepson my age named Johnny. And we used to go climb the fence between our properties and I'd go over to his house and play football and he'd come over to my house and go swimming or whatever it was. And so one afternoon when I was there playing football, we went into the kitchen and Judy was in there making soup. And I said to her, I was like nine years old. I said, hey, you know, Mrs. Luff, I loved that movie or, and you know, the, the Wizard of Oz. She said, oh, thanks, honey. And I said, can you sing that song for me? And she sang like the first stanza 
of somewhere over the rainbow while I was eating cookies and she was making soup. But aside from that, I asked her a lot, a couple of times about Margaret Hamilton. And she said that Margaret Hamilton was this sweet, sweet, really nice lady who at the time that she made the movie was only 36 years old. People thought she was like this old hag. She was only 36 years old. She was five foot two, so they had to put her up on lifts for her shoes. And she was one of the only cast members who never complained about the Technicolor lights and the fact that she was dressed in black and everything was hot and it was crazy. And she was also the only one that really got hurt because that makeup, that green makeup had a copper base. It was made out of copper. And when she appeared in that plume of fire, she was so close to the flame that flame heated up the copper and gave her second degree burns on her face. They had to shut down her scenes for over a month. And when she came back, it was like, I'm back, come on, let's everybody get to work. So she was this really sweet, sweet lady, fantastic character actress. So I not only loved that figure, but I really loved Margaret Hamilton because I think she's cinema's most definitive witch. I think she's so awesome in The Wizard of Oz, and there she is. All right, so here's something else I want to show you. I love this thing right here. This is a female hero T-Rex head built by the Stan Winston Company for Jurassic Park 2. We have stuff in this show from Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 when they were still using practical heads and practical dinosaurs. But look at the size of this thing. This is a hydraulic head. The hydraulics in it make it mouth move, the eyes move, the tongue moves, and it's still in beautiful condition. I just love these things. It's not often that you get to meet one of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. And if you can see, you can almost, let's see, it's putting, putting your head in this thing. You know, you can imagine when the actors were working with these things and they were mine, mounted on all of these hydraulic mechanisms, these things coming after you, it's like, it wasn't funny, it was like scary. But this stuff is so beautiful. She's so impressive, I just love her. So having this here in the show gives people a chance to see the scope and the depth and not only the beautiful work that the Stan Winston company did, but look at the size of this monster. You don't get to meet a T-Rex in the flesh up close like that very often. So again, with the raptors and the T-Rexes and the compies and the pteranodons and all that, I'm really happy to have this stuff here because I love all the Jurassic Park stuff. Okay, that raptor that you're looking at right now is really cool because that's the first raptor that Stan Winston built that Spielberg signed off on for Jurassic Park 1. That's the first raptor they built for the movie. That's in Stan Winston's book, The Winston Effect. And it's a picture of Stan standing next to it. Raptors were only the size of about a standard poodle in real life. And Spielberg made, wanted them to be the villain, so they made him a lot bigger. But that thing's in beautiful condition. It's the first one they ever built. So I'm really proud to have that here too. And I love those dinosaurs. I think those are great villains. All the raptors are awesome. This is Stan Winston's maquette for the Spinosaur from Jurassic Park 3. And if you look at the maquette carefully and then you pan up and see the head here, you'll see it's almost exactly the same. So this was built first, was approved by the director, and then became this. Now I find myself wondering how on earth, I mean, we're in the, we're in the heart of Hollywood. Hollywood Boulevard's right out in the front door. I mean, how do you guys get something that massive in here? Oh, these were all forklifted in. Man. Before, I mean, they had to come in first. So we had to bring forklifts in to move this stuff, and the forklifts to take them out of it, too. Here are a bunch of life casts. Life casts are a process that makeup men and makeup departments use where they take plaster castings of actors' faces and then they build the makeup on the plaster casting so the actor doesn't have to sit hour and hour and hour while the makeups are being built. That process was started in 1920 and still is exactly the same today. It's the only makeup process that has existed over decades and decades and decades. But there are a lot of interesting things here. Bela Lugosi, Christopher Lee, Vincent Price, Lon Chaney, Peter Lorre, but what's really interesting is this is a life cast of Bruce Lee's face. I found the only original of this that 20th Century Fox, which was made 
when he did the Green Hornet in 66 when he was Cato. I loved Bruce so much <clears throat> that I just wanted him in the show, even though he doesn't quite fit with all the horror guys. But this cast of Bruce Lee's face was, to me, gold. Now, what's really cool is, here's Boris Karloff in 1931. This came from the Universal Makeup Department, and that life cast was used by Jack Pierce, who made all the famous monsters. That was used to make the mummy up there, and the second version of the mummy, which is Art of Bay. He becomes a man later in the movie, and you can see his, the actual face, Karloff's face in here. And this also was used to make the most famous face in movie history, which was the Frankenstein monster. And here he is, in all of his glory. And the thing that's so cool also is, everybody thought Boris Karloff was like this giant. Boris Karloff in real life was about five foot 11, just under six feet, but with the big shoes and the suit of padding and everything, everybody thought he was a giant, but he really wasn't. But anyway, that's the most famous face in horror history made from that life cast, and I love it. And this guy is one of my favorite actors ever, Bela Lugosi. If it hadn't been for Bela Lugosi and the, and the success of Dracula, the whole universal horror movie cycle may not have been launched. But because Lugosi's movie was so popular and did so well, he really was responsible for like launching the whole thing. And I know he didn't have the career later on that Karloff had, but Lugosi is really, really important, not only to film history, but he's important to us here in the show, because I've always loved him. I thought he was great. Okay, so you guys, Peter Jackson is a friend of mine. I got to know him pretty well when we did the restoration of the 1933 King Kong. If you look at that film and you watch the special features, I'm in it, Peter's in it, there's a bunch of us talking because Kong was my favorite movie. And I, I don't want to get into it, but I have a lot of history with that movie. But um, Peter became a friend of mine, so he invited me and my wife to go visit him at Weta in New Zealand. And we got over there, of course, saw all the orcs and all the Kong stuff. This is the very first costume that the, the hero uh, orc, this is Lurtz's costume, that's his armor, that's his life cast and makeup, that's everything from the first movie. And then Peter sent me, I asked him if he would give me some orcs, he sent me this orc and that orc. And I said, I'm gonna put it in a, a, a museum. And he said, fantastic, he's got his own museum, which is obviously really awesome too. Speaking of King Kong, he's got one of the original armatures. But all the orc stuff, orc stuff is really cool because Peter's a friend, and I love those movies, and so here they are. Okay, so you can't have a collection like this with sci-fi without having Star Wars stuff in it. And this st Star Wars stuff is really cool. This was built by ILM. It's a Turing costume for Darth Vader from The Empire Strikes Back. That thing is so cool. This is one of the production-made heads that was used in Star Wars 1 and 2, or actually Star Wars 4 and 5. But anyway, and here's a Boba Fett costume. This is a small stormtrooper because Luke Skywalker, this was supposed to be one of his, and he was much smaller than most of the regular stormtroopers. And this is Alec Guinness's life cast and makeup as Obi-Wan Kenobi, so I totally love all that stuff. Here, come with me and we'll see some more stuff. Here's Kate Beckinsale's costume from Underworld. This is from Underworld Evolution. That's her entire costume. Again, spandex and leather. She was very small but fit into that costume, which is really cool. And this is Jennifer Lawrence's entire costume, which includes the bow, the quiver, the arrows, everything from Hunger Games Catching Fire. That's Katniss's hero costume. And everything in that picture, or in that display case is in this picture down there. If you can see it, there's a lot of reflections on that, but that's exactly what it is, and she's wearing it. You guys, this is so cool, because it's like the holy grail of Harry Potter stuff. That's his acceptance letter to Hogwarts that comes down the chimney, and then the other letter is a list of requirements of stuff that he needed to take to school, but that was really cool. Here's a Voldemort costume and, and uh, a wand, and this is one of Harry's original costumes from um, Deathly Hollows. so that's so cool. And then here's Dobby hiding behind Harry. A lot of Terminator stuff, we have a lot of Terminator stuff. The endoskeletons are both from Terminator 2. The, Arnold in the middle is his costume from Terminator 2 and even his grenade launcher. The makeup came from Stan Winston. That's one of Schwarzenegger's heads. Here's a test makeup that he didn't use in the movie that shows more of the robot's face, but it's cool to have one of Stan's tests here. Robert Patrick's bullet, expanding bullet shirt. It's actually got all the cables behind it, which makes these things breathe. And the guy in the back is Schwarzenegger from T3. 
Lot more Star Wars stuff. The world's most famous robot, obviously. This is C-3PO. That was built by the Don Post Studios, and that's marked number two. The first one went to Lucas, the second one came here. So that was really cool. One of the only KSRO ro robots that was ever built. And then there's a lot of really cool stuff in here that I love. I love the lightsaber that Luke Skywalker used. That's Mark Hamill's lifesaver from Return of the Jedi. But this, you guys, this is one of my favorite, thing, favorite things in the whole show. That's Ray Park's hero costume is Darth Maul from Phantom Menace. And I love, Darth Maul was my favorite Star Wars villain. Um, and I just love having that. And that's Ray's life cast and makeup. All of this stuff, all of these are Academy Award winning makeups from John Chambers in 1968 with the first Planet of the Apes up to 2001 with Rick Baker's version. And there's a lot of famous people under these makeups. Up on top is Michael Clark Duncan. Over here is Tim Roth. Over here is Helena Bonham Carter. That's Paul Giamatti. And then in the back, we have Maurice Evans. And then we have Kim Hunter on the left and Roddy McDowell. So both of the Planet of the Apes kickoff movies, the one from 68, Planet of the Apes, and the one from 2001, they're both in here. And as I said, John Chambers won an Academy Award in 68 for Planet of the Apes, and Rick Baker won the Academy Award in 2001 for the same movie. All right, so we have entered a horror hallway, which has a lot of scary stuff in it, but a lot of stuff that I'm really proud of, like this, for instance. That's the original muzzle mask. They take Hannibal Lecter off the plane with the Silence of the Lambs, and next to it is one of his screen-used straitjackets and prison uniforms. So we have a lot of Anthony Hopkins stuff here. He won the Academy Award for Best Actor for that, but that's all the original stuff. Okay, now, you guys, this is really scary. Bonnie Aarons from The Nun. Now, I was born and raised a Catholic, so I was always around a lot of nuns. This is a very unusual looking nun, but that's not the reason I think it's really cool. The reason I think it's cool is when I had the chance to buy the costume from the movie The Nun, and remember, The Nun came from the Conjuring series. This is actually from the movie The Nun. When I had a chance to buy it, I picked up the costume, and in the pocket was this little pillbox. We thought, what the hell is that? I mean, the, the auction house must have not known that that was in there as well. So we opened up the pillbox and it was her contacts. What? Yeah, so it's not only her costume, but those are the contacts he wore, she wore. And Bonnie Aarons in real life is really sweet. Again, a villain who's really sweet. But she's very, very interesting. She's an interesting looking lady. And this is Bonnie in her entire getup with her, with her contacts. So awesome. Well, Doug Bradley became another guy like Robert England. Robert famous for playing Freddy. Doug famous for playing Pinhead. This is one of his original costumes and his armaments from the first Hellraiser movie, including one of the puzzle boxes, and that's his head and makeup as Pinhead. So this became a very iconic horror figure, started off in the late 70s and then became so many sequels, but Doug was the guy who was really famous for playing that. And the people who know Doug, like the people who know Robert England, say he's a great guy, like totally nice. I think the single scariest thing in this whole show is the ring girl. There's one of her victims, that's Amber Tamblyn. They find that body in the closet in the movie. And then look, here's the girl herself. One of these days when I do a bigger version of this place, I'll put her on a ram so she'll run at people. Jeez Louise. But that's really, <laughs> I think that's really scary. The pose and everything, it's just so weird. These are the first two zombies built for the Walking Dead series. These were built in 2010. The guy on the left is Patient Zero and the girl on the right is Bicycle Girl. Greg Nicotero's company and Greg himself built that stuff. But those were the first two they were ever used. And if you look over here, here's Norman Reedus as one of his hero costumes in Crossbow from Walking Dead. <clears throat> as you know, this character kills a lot of zombies with arrows, and you can see the guy on the ground that he just got. But that was given to us, lent to us actually, by AMC when they heard we were doing this because they wanted Walking Dead included. So that's all the original stuff too, and I really think that's awesome. It's great to have Norman Reedus in here. Okay, so this is like the holy grail of alien stuff, you guys. This is the original costume worn in the first movie by a Nigerian actor named Balaji Bajeho. That guy was six foot ten and they only weighed 154 pounds. That's how he could fit into these thin, thin, thin legs. But that thing is so cool. And next to it is one of Carlo Rambaldi's drawings of the original sketches of the alien head. And you can see Balaji's you can see him wearing the headpiece, which would fit right into this thing. He could only see out of the bottom part of the neck down there. And if you look carefully enough, you see that that's seamed, so he can see through that. 
But anyway, there it is. That's, that's the original. And this guy was so cool. Balaji, he was the guy who played the monster and everybody loved him and he was very sweet. He died at a very young age. He died when he was 39 years old. But he was still totally awesome and this great big tall thin guy would fit, fit into this. That's so awesome. There's so much stuff to see here. We're just going to have to go through quickly. But we have a lot of aliens and predators. The stuff is very popular with people. They love all the stuff. Back there is the hero costume from Predator 2. These are war party heads also from Predator 2. Standing above them is a hybrid, both alien and predator mix. And that's from uh, Alien versus Predator. There's a suit from Predators. Oh, here's the newborn from Alien Resurrection that thinks Sigourney Weaver's its mom. The eggs are from the hive in Aliens, from the hive scene, and of course, guarding the hive and giving birth to all these things. Is this fantastic, the queen alien? I mean, <clears throat> this thing is 16 feet high and 19 feet long. It's so awesome, as built by the Stan Winston Company. And what's really cool is here's the maquette. This was in Stan's office. That's the maquette built for and signed off by Stan and James Cameron before they built the full-size one. And every single thing in here, every tooth, every rib, every line, everything is exactly the same as the big one up there. So, I mean, they did a great job with it, and it's so cool. Then we have a lot of other stuff. We have an alien puppet here. That's from Alien vs. Predator. One of the original face huggers from Aliens from the lab scene. And then all of these, all of these guys here are costumes. There's Predator costumes from the first movie with Schwarzenegger in 86. This is Alien vs. Predator from 2004. Here's a mate to that. By the way, these costumes when they're put on are over 90 pounds. So the guys that wore them, the great big tall guys, the seven foot two guys that wore them, could only be in them for like 25 minutes because it's foam and resin and it's so warm, it's so hot, very, very heavy. This is a beautiful, um, uh, wolf Predator, and this is from uh, Alien vs. Predator Requiem. But I mean, all of this stuff, here's the only alien costume they had on stage for Alien Resurrection. You can see how the legs get wider for the stuntmen. Not, not as thin as the original costume because the guys were normal, they didn't have that kind of, of size and that weight. So they all, you can see how everything changes. And then we get into more horror stuff. Tom Woodruff, who became a famous makeup man and a stuntman, wore this costume, that's Stan Winston's original uh, pumpkin head. And if you look down here, you can see that kind of before the, the actual foot starts, there's these points. They did that so he could foot, put his feet in there because he was standing on two foot stilts. So wearing this costume was really hard, really hard, hot and hard to balance. And then here's all the Chucky stuff, the Freddy chest of souls, one of Robert England's faces and makeup from New Nightmare, one of, one of Freddy's left hands. The Chucky stuff is all original. It's an original Chucky doll from the first movie. The two other ones are from Child's Play 2, and that's a, that's a good guy doll. The two dolls in the back are from Bride of Chucky. Here's, here's Freddy's costume from Freddy 5. That's his hat, his glove, his shoes, everything. That's all the original stuff. And this is one of the original Saw puppets and the tricycle. And then, of course, you know, you have to have, you have to have um, Jason. So here's Jason, and this is from Friday the 13th, Part 7. That was actually in Crystal Lake. This costume, when I got it, it was waterlogged. And I had to, like, fix this thing, dry it all up and restore it. So that's cool. Okay, so here's one of the things that I'm so proud of. It's one of my favorite things in the whole show, and it's right here. And this is the spider head from The Thing. Now, you guys, when I got this, this thing was trashed. It came from Rob Bottin's lab. It was completely trashed and I had the whole thing rebuilt so it looked like it did originally in the movie. But this is the original, here it is. It's a spider head from the thing. I love that movie. It's a John Carpenter movie, I think that's great. By the way, John Carpenter and I went to school together at USC and we graduated standing next to each other because his name is spelled C-A and mine is C-O. So we were right next to each other with Nick Castle. There's another guy and he's the guy that played the shape. So we were all at USC together. Anyway, I love that thing. I love this thing. This is a Mike Hill piece. This is Lon Chaney Jr. from The Wolfman, 1941. And obviously, this is probably the most famous Wolfman in the history of the movies. Certainly the most important, because over five movies, Chaney was the only actor that played this part. And that was part of the universal stable of horror movies and monsters. I just love it. Here's a 
This is a replica built by Patrick McGee of an American werewolf in London. I do have a number of the original transformation heads, just don't have room for it all. That's, believe it or not, that's Hannibal Lecter, that's Anthony Hopkins playing a werewolf from the Wolfman, the one that was made in 2010, because he played uh, Benicio Del Toro's father. I also have Benicio's stuff, the werewolf stuff. He played his father and that's the screen used costume. All of those hair, all the hairs on there were hand punched. So that's really hard to do. And the same year that American Werewolf came out, The Howling came out. That's one of Rob Boutin's hero costumes and heads from the movie. And here's a Jack Nicholson head from Wolf. The guy who produced this movie, Douglas Wick, is not only one of my best friends, he was my next door neighbor for 15 years. So we grew up together. So he, he knew I loved all the horror stuff. That's not why he did it, but he's the one that made Wolf and I love that. Oh, if you look over here, we have Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice. That's the Beetlejuice snake behind him. And this is Vladimir Furtick's original stunt head and his costume from Game of Thrones as the Night King. He was the main villain. This costume came from season four. Now it went on for eight seasons. And in the, in the seventh and eighth season, he was in a lot more of it. But this is one of the early costumes and one of the stunt heads. All of that came from England. And over here, of course, one of the most famous things ever. This is a replica because in the show, she moves and scares everybody. So we had to put a replica in here, although I do have a bunch of Dick Smith Exorcist stuff. But this is Joseph Becerra's screen used makeup effects and costume from The Conjuring. That's the, the witch that sits on top of the dresser. Okay, well, obviously I'm very, very happy that this is in here. This is one of Johnny Depp's original screen used costumes from Edward Scissorhands. So this is a costume that Depp wore over in this case it's a pair of the original scissor hands, which happens to be ones that were made out of metal. They only made one pair of those, and there that is. But having this here is so cool. And what's really cool is the people who did the makeup and hair for this movie, V. Neal, they came in when they found out we were doing this and said, we want to do his hair and make him look exactly like he did. And they're the ones that did that on the mannequin. So it's fantastic. I love that. Hey, so come on down this way. Here's Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Not only is he in his original screen use costume, but that's the original remote that runs the time machine, so cool. And a nice, a beautiful head of Christopher Lloyd. In the back is Brad Pitt as an, a young man, an old man, and then the baby board as an old man in the curious case of Benjamin Button. This is the screen used auntie. That's the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids ant. That's one of the stop motion animation ants that they used for that. And this is really cool. Here are two thing hands from the original Adams Family movie from 1991. This is a static hand, but in the back, is a hand that has a remote control car underneath it where the hand ran around in the hallway. That's the remote that ran it. And if you look back there, you can see the wheels. So this, these are two versions of the, the first thing from Adam's family. That's the one that ran around the halls. That was awesome. There's stuff all around. There's one more thing that I really love that I want to show you though. Over here is Brandon Lee's hero costume from The Crow from 1994. Now, unfortunately, we know what happened to Brandon on this film. The actor, he, the actor was killed during the movie. This is not the costume he was wearing when he was killed, but this is one of his hero costumes. But I wanted him in here because like his dad, <clears throat> not only was I a fan, but Brandon was a, an acquaintance of mine. I had lunch with him a couple of times, talked about being in one of his movies as a stunt guy. And I loved him, he was a great guy. That, he didn't deserve to go that way, but he has to be in here. It is a, a fantasy movie, but I really wanted him in here. Never stays a day. A battle's always a coming away. 